The Zodiac Killer is the pseudonym of an unidentified serial killer who stalked Northern California in the late 1960s. The case is considered by many to be the most famous unsolved murder case in American history. The murders have become a fixture of popular culture and has inspired amateur detectives to attempt to solve it. The Zodiac murdered at least five victims in the San Francisco Bay Area between December of 1968 and October of 1969. The victims were young couples and a lone male cab driver. Two of the wounded victims survived. The Zodiac Killer claimed to have murdered 37 victims and has been linked to many other cold cases. The Zodiac coined this name in a series of taunting letters and postcards that were mailed to newspapers, in which he threatened killing sprees and bombings if they were not printed. Some of the letters included cryptograms, or ciphers, in which the killer claimed that he was collecting his victims as slaves for the afterlife. Of the four ciphers he produced, two remain unsolved, and one was cracked only in 2020. Although the Zodiac ceased written communications around 1974, the unusual nature of the case led to international interest that has been sustained throughout the years. The San Francisco Police Department marked the case inactive in April 2004, but reopened it at some point prior to March 2007. The case also remains open in the city of Vallejo, as well as in Napa and Solano counties. The California Department of Justice has maintained an open case file on the Zodiac murders since 1969. The first murders attributed to the Zodiac Killer were the shootings of high school students Betty Lou Jensen and David Arthur Faraday on Lake Herman Road, just inside the city limits of Benicia. The couple was on their first date and planned to attend a Christmas concert at Hogan High School, about three blocks from Jensen's home. At approximately 10.15 p.m., Faraday parked his mother's rambler in a gravel turnout, which was a well-known lover's lane. Shortly after 11 p.m., their bodies were found by Stella Borges, who lived nearby. The Solano County Sheriff's Department investigated the crime, but no leads developed. Robert Graysmith later speculated in his 1976 account that another car pulled into the turnout just prior to 11 p.m. and parked beside the couple. The killer may have exited the second car and walked toward the Rambler, possibly ordering the couple out of it. It appeared that Jensen had exited the car first, but when Faraday was halfway out, the killer shot him in the head. The killer shot Jensen five times in the back as she fled, her body was found 28 feet from the car. The next attack attributed to the Zodiac Killer is known as the Blue Rock Springs Murder. Just before midnight on a July 1969 night, Darlene Farron and Michael Majo drove into the Blue Rock Springs Park in Vallejo and parked. While the couple sat in Farron's car, a second car drove into the lot and parked alongside them but almost immediately drove away. The car returned about 10 minutes later and parked behind them. The driver of the other car exited and approached the passenger side door of Farron's car, carrying a flashlight and a pistol. The killer pointed the flashlight into Majo's and Farron's eyes before shooting at them, firing five times. Both victims were hit and several bullets passed through Majo and into Farron. The killer walked away from the car but returned and shot each victim twice more before driving off. Farron was pronounced dead at the hospital. Majo survived the attack despite being shot in the face, neck, and chest. Majo described his attacker as a 5 foot 8 inch white male with short, light brown curly hair. Majo estimated his attacker to be about 26 to 30 years old and weighed approximately 200 pounds. In early August of 1969, three letters purportedly prepared by the killer were received at the Vallejo Times Herald, the San Francisco Chronicle, and the San Francisco Examiner. The letters were nearly identical and took credit for the shootings at Lake Herman Road and Blue Rock Springs. Each letter also included one-third of a 408-symbol cryptogram which the killer claimed contained his identity. The killer demanded the letters be printed on each paper's front page or he would kill up to a dozen more people over the next weekend. The threatened murders did not happen, and all three parts of the cryptogram were eventually published. 
About a week after the first three letters, the San Francisco Examiner received a letter with the salutation, Dear Editor, this is the Zodiac speaking. This was the first time the killer had used this name for identification. In the letter, the Zodiac included details about the murders that had not yet been released to the public. The killer also said that if the police cracked his code, his identity would be revealed. Shortly after the cryptogram was printed, Donald and Betty Harden of Salinas, California cracked the 408 symbol cryptogram. It contained a misspelled message in which the killer seemed to reference the most dangerous game. The author also said that he was collecting slaves for his afterlife. No name appears in this decoded text. The killer said that he would not give away his identity because it would slow down or stop his slave collection. The Zodiac Killer's next attack occurred at Lake Berryessa. In late September of 1969, college students Brian Hartnell and Cecilia Shepard were picnicking at Lake Berryessa on a small island connected by a sand spit to Twin Oak Ridge. A white man approached them wearing a black executioner's type hood with clip-on sunglasses over the eye holes and a bib-like device on his chest that had a white 3x3-inch cross-circle symbol on it. He approached them with a pistol, the hooded man claimed to be an escaped convict from a jail. He said that he needed their car and money to travel to Mexico because the stolen vehicle was too hot. The killer had brought pre-cut lengths of plastic clothesline and told Shepard to tie up Hartnell, before he tied up Shepard. The killer checked and tightened Hartnell's bonds after discovering that Shepard had bound Hartnell's hands loosely. Hartnell initially believed this event to be a bizarre robbery, but the man drew a knife and stabbed them both repeatedly. Hartnell suffered six and Shepard ten wounds in the process. The killer hiked about 500 yards up to Knoxville Road, drew the cross-circle symbol on Hartnell's car door with a black felt-tip pen. At 7.40 p.m., the killer called the Napa County Sheriff's Office from a pay telephone to report his latest crime. KVON radio reporter Pat Stanley found the phone, still off the hook, a few minutes later at the Napa car wash on Main Street in Napa. It was a few blocks from the sheriff's office, and 27 miles from the crime scene. Detectives lifted a still wet palm print from the telephone but were never able to match it to any suspect. After hearing the victim's screams for help, a man and his son fishing in a nearby cove discovered the couple and got help by contacting park rangers. Napa County Sheriff's deputies Dave Collins and Ray Land were the first law enforcement officers to arrive at the crime scene. Shepard was conscious when Collins arrived and provided him with a detailed description of the attacker. Hartnell and Shepard were taken to Queen of the Valley Hospital in Napa by ambulance. Shepard lapsed into a coma during transport, never regained consciousness, and died two days later. Hartnell survived to recount his tale to the press. A few weeks later, in October of 1969, a white male passenger entered the cab driven by Paul Stein in San Francisco. The passenger requested to be driven to Presidio Heights. The passenger shot Stein once in the head with a handgun, took the driver's wallet and car keys, and tore away a section of his bloodstained shirt tail. Three teenagers saw the incident and phoned the police while the crime was in progress. They observed a man wiping the cab down before walking away toward the Presidio, one block to the north. Two blocks from the crime scene, patrol officers Don Falk and Eric Zelms, responding to the call, observed a white man walking along the sidewalk east on Jackson Street and stepping onto a stairway leading up to the front yard of one of the homes on the north side of the street. The encounter lasted only 5 to 10 seconds. Falk estimated the white male pedestrian to be 35 to 45 years old, 5 feet 10 inches tall with a crew cut, similar to but slightly older and taller than the description provided by the teenagers who observed the killer getting in and out of Stein's cab. The teenagers described the suspect to be 25 to 30 years old with a crew cut and standing approximately 5 feet 8 inches to 5 feet 9 inches tall. However, the police radio dispatcher had alerted officers to look out for a black suspect, so Falk and Zelms drove past the perpetrator without stopping, the mistaken descriptions remains unexplained. A search ensued, but no suspects were found. 
This was the last officially confirmed murder by the Zodiac Killer. The Stein murder was initially believed to be a routine robbery that had escalated into homicidal violence. However, the San Francisco Chronicle received a new letter from Zodiac that claimed credit for the killing and contained a torn section of Stein's bloody shirt to prove it. The three teen witnesses worked with a police artist to prepare a composite sketch of Stein's killer. Detectives Dave Tashi and Bill Armstrong were assigned to the case. The San Francisco Police Department investigated an estimated 2,500 suspects over a period of many years. In November of 1969, the Zodiac Killer mailed a postcard with another cryptogram consisting of 340 characters. This cipher, dubbed Z340, remained unsolved for over 51 years. In December of 2020, it was deciphered by an international team of private citizens, including American software engineer David Orenchak, Australian mathematician Sam Blake and Belgian programmer Jarl Van Eyck. The message stated, I hope you are having lots of fun and trying to catch me. That wasn't me on the TV show which brings up a point about me. I am not afraid of the gas chamber because it will send me to paradise all the sooner because I now have enough slaves to work for me. Where everyone else has nothing when they reach paradise, so they are afraid of death. I am not afraid because I know that my new life is life will be an easy one in paradise. The team submitted their findings to the Federal Bureau of Investigation, which verified the discovery. The FBI stated that the decoded message gave no further clues to the identity of the Zodiac Killer. 19. There is no consensus on the number of victims that the Zodiac had or the length of his criminal spree. In the 1986 non-fiction book Zodiac, author Robert Graysmith published a list attributing 49 victims to the Zodiac Killer. This list included some crimes which have either been entirely solved or whose links to the Zodiac Killer have been completely discredited by investigators. Various other authors speculated at the time of the killings that several other high-profile murders and attacks may have been the work of the Zodiac, but none have been confirmed. In April of 2004, the San Francisco Police Department marked the Zodiac case inactive, citing caseload pressure and resource demands, effectively closing the case. However, they reopened their case sometime before March 2007. The case is open in Napa County. In May of 2018, the Vallejo Police Department announced their intention to attempt to collect the Zodiac Killer's DNA from the back of stamps he used during his correspondence. The analysis, by a private laboratory, was expected to check the DNA against GED match. It was hoped the Zodiac Killer may be caught in a similar fashion to the Golden State Killer Joseph James D'Angelo. However, as of October 2022, no results have been reported. Although there have been many suspects in the Zodiac Killer case, two stand out. The first notable suspect was Arthur Lee Allen. Robert Graysmith's book Zodiac advanced Arthur Lee Allen, who died in 1992, as a potential suspect based on circumstantial evidence. Allen had been interviewed by police from the early days of the Zodiac investigations and was the subject of several search warrants over a 20-year period. In 2007, Graysmith noted that several police detectives described Allen as the most likely suspect. In 2010, Dave Tashi stated that all the evidence against Allen ultimately turned out to be negative. Tashi's daughter said in 2018 that her father had always thought Allen had been the killer, but they did not have the evidence to prove it. In October of 1969, Allen was interviewed by Detective John Lynch of the Vallejo Police Department. Allen had been reported in the vicinity of the Lake Berryessa attack against Hartnell and Shepard, he described himself scuba diving at Salt Point on the day of the attacks. Allen again came to police attention in 1971 when his friend Donald Cheney reported to police in Manhattan Beach, California, that Allen had spoken of his desire to kill people, used the name Zodiac, and secured a flashlight to a firearm for visibility at night. According to Cheney, this conversation occurred no later than January of 1969. 
Jack Molinox of the Vallejo Police Department subsequently wrote that Allen had received a dishonorable discharge from the U.S. Navy in 1958 and had been fired from his job as an elementary school teacher in March 1968 after allegations of sexual misconduct with students. He was generally well regarded by those who knew him, but he was also described as fixated on young children and angry at women. In September of 1972, San Francisco police obtained a search warrant for Allen's residence. In 1974, Allen was arrested for sexually assaulting a 12-year-old boy, he pleaded guilty and served two years in prison. Vallejo police served another search warrant at Allen's residence in February of 1991. Two days after Allen's death in 1992, Vallejo police served another warrant and seized property from his residence. In July of 1992, victim Mike Majo identified Allen as the man who shot him in 1969 from a photo lineup. However, police officer Donald Falk, who is speculated to have seen the Zodiac fleeing from the Stein killing, said in a 2007 documentary about Allen, that he weighed about 100 pounds more than the man he saw, adding that his face was too round. Nancy Slover, who received the call from the Zodiac in the aftermath of the Majo and Farron shooting, said that Allen did not sound like the man she spoke with on the phone. In 2002, the San Francisco Police Department developed a partial DNA profile from the saliva on stamps and envelopes of the Zodiac's letters. The San Francisco Police Department compared this partial DNA to that of Arthur Lee Allen. A DNA comparison was also made with the DNA of Don Cheney, who was Allen's former close friend and the first person to suggest Allen may be the Zodiac killer. Since neither test result indicated a match, Allen and Cheney were excluded as the contributors of the DNA. Retired police handwriting expert Lloyd Cunningham, who worked on the Zodiac case for decades, stated that none of Allen's writing even came close to the Zodiac killers. Nor did DNA extracted from the envelopes with the Zodiac's letters come close to Arthur Lee Allen. Another notable suspect was Gary Francis Post. In October 2021, the Case Breakers, a team of over 40 cold case investigators composed of former law enforcement investigators, military intelligence officers, and journalists, claimed to have identified the Zodiac Killer as Gary Francis Post, who died in 2018 at the age of 80. The team claimed to have uncovered forensic evidence and photos from Post's darkroom and noted that scars on Post's forehead matched those they said were described on the killer. They also claimed that removing the letters of Post's name from one of the Zodiac's cryptograms revealed an alternate message. Law enforcement expressed skepticism regarding the team's findings. Additionally, the case breaker's claims largely relied on circumstantial evidence, and author Tom Voigt, a Zodiac killer investigator, called the claims false. Voigt noted that no witnesses in the case described the Zodiac as having scars on his forehead. In the nearly five decades since the Zodiac's murders, no suspect has ever been arrested and the inability to identify the Zodiac killer has continued to frustrate law enforcement to this day.